one. And this constitutes what they call in football, maybe it's a subject we don't want to talk about tonight, uh, the two-minute warning. So if you sort of make your way down here, uh, grab whatever comestibles you would like to bring with you, and we'll get started in about two minutes. So do indeed come on down and get settled in. And I think we're on. Uh, my name is David Jolliffe. I am the interim temporary returning uh, chair of the Tipping McMichael Committee, and it's a real pleasure to have you here tonight. Uh, I'll be brief because you have come to hear Bishop Griswold, but just a few things before we get started. Uh, I always like to begin these events with what I call a word from our sponsor. And if you would look on the inside of your program, there's a substantial bit about Clifton Tipping McMichael, who so very generously endowed uh, St. Paul's and enabled us not only to offer this uh, lectureship series, but largely everything we do in outreach in this congregation does can some way uh, make, take benefit of the endowment that Tipping McMichael left for us. So I always like to echo what our former rector, Lowell Grisham, used to say, remember St. Paul in your will if you can, because remembering St. Paul in your will leads to such wonderful events a as this. Um, do remember that tomorrow at 10, Bishop Griswold will be with us here again. Actually, he's going to be with us all day tomorrow. We're going to work him mercilessly. Uh, he's going to preach at the 845 and the 11 o'clock service, and then we'll be addressing the adult forum uh, uh, in, in between at the 10 o'clock. So if you're going to be in church tomorrow morning, uh, you'll have a chance to, to interact with him again. Uh, there are books by Bishop Griswold for sale back at the book table, uh, and uh, they, they will be for sale afterwards. And Bishop Griswold has assured us that he would be happy to stick around and sign the books if you'd like to do that. Um, I want to just give you a little advance warning. It's not in your program, but just a little bit of a preview of coming attractions for t the Tipping McMichael Lectureship Series. If you would mark on your calendars or in your head or wherever you mark things on your, on your iPhone, March 7th and 8th. Uh, we hope to be hosting that night the Reverend Winnie Varghese, who is on the staff of uh, Trinity Wall Street. She's a priest. She's also director of social outreach at, Saint, at Trinity Wall Street. And we've been trying to get her to come for a long, long time, and I think we finally have her. Uh, even before that, uh, we are in negotiation with a person in San Diego who is just a regular parishioner in a church who three times a week loads up her van, drives across the border to Tijuana, and feeds uh, people who are in line to get asylum uh, to try to get into the U.S., and I think this would speak uh, strongly to the people who are working with the sanctuary movement here. So uh, more about those that they develop. We're, we're still kind of um, in formation on both of those dates, but we're hoping that's going to happen very, very soon. Um, so March 7th and 8th, to be sure, and the other date, we'll let you know as soon as we know about it. Uh, we always like to let folks know that the Tippy McMichael Lectureship Series is run by a committee. And if this is an interesting uh, opportunity for you to work with this committee, we'd del be delighted to have you. Uh, find me afterwards tonight, if you'd like, or find me at church tomorrow morning. I'll be at the 11 o'clock service. And let me know that you're interested in being part of this uh, operation. We really do select speakers who are coming here on the basis of recommendations by committee members. And we also field recommendations from people in the congregation who, and who come to these events. So if there's someone whom you've encountered and you say, yeah, that person would make a great speaker at the Tipping McMichael Committee, please do let me know, and we'll be glad to include you in the discussions, put you on the committee, involve you in whatever every way you'd like to be involved. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Evan, our director, who's going to introduce Bishop Griswold. 
Thank you, David. Thank you for your help with this committee, and thank you to all those who helped uh, prepare for this evening and to our St. Spatulas Guild for hosting us. I've had a distinct pleasure for the last sort of day or so, last night and then again today, to spend a little time with Br Bishop Griswold uh, and to hear him speak about his love of the church, a love that has brought him uh, to us this evening. Uh, we all prayed for Frank, our presiding bishop, for the nine years that he served as presiding bishop. A pretty interesting time in the life of the Episcopal Church, 98 to 07, is that right? Uh, uh, 06, a pretty interesting time in the life of our church. But what I heard Bishop Griswold say today is that he misses it. He didn't tell me that he missed the drama or the stress or the travel, but he misses the relationships that he was able to form, not only with other bishops, but of course throughout the church, and relationships beyond the Episcopal Church. Uh, Bishop Griswold has served, as you can read in his biography, uh, in some ecumenical partnerships and some work, and I heard him speak about that with real warmth in his heart. Uh, and that warmth and that desire for relationship keeps him busy, keeps him in relationship with uh, the Society of St. John the Evangelist, and several seminaries, including Swanee, the School of Theology at Swanee, where he visits and ministers to the faculty a couple of times a year. Uh, Bishop Griswold uh, keeps a busy schedule, even though he lives in Philadelphia, where he's from. Took a while to get back to Philadelphia, but back to that area. And we have a distinct pleasure of welcoming him and enjoying him with us. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Frank Griswold. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, am I on? Okay, all right. One has to make sure that one is heard. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I've had a wonderful day with Evan, and uh, uh, someone said, well, how did you end up here? And it has to do with a retired professor at Temple University in Philadelphia who goes to the same gym that I go to. And the locker room conversations are always very high-toned and intellectual. <laughs> there are professors and lawyers and doctors and scientists. I said we should be on NPR. We're so literate and insightful. In any event, this particular professor is a friend and colleague of David Jolliffe. And uh, so I'm here because of my Jewish professor friend in the gym in Philadelphia, which simply is an illustration of how wacky the spirit is and how things actually work in our lives. So um, one of the things one often does when one is preparing for things such as this is uh, try to think of a title before you really know what you're going to say and then hope in some way that you honor it when you actually come to the occasion itself. So I took part of a quotation from Gerard Manley Hopkins who in addition to his poetry also wrote a commentary on the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, he being a Jesuit. And uh, one of the phrases was, the world is word, expression, news of God. So I thought, let's just begin with that one. And of course, here, uh, what I'm thinking of is not simply the natural world, and I, I'm going to talk about that, uh, but the world in all its fullness, we as inhabitants of the world, how the world impinges upon us, shapes us, molds us, challenges us, informs us, and how the world is revelatory. And I think here of some words from the 12th century, Bernard of Clairvaux, who said we must read both the book of scripture and the book of experience. And I find that useful coming from the 12th century and Bernard of Clairvaux, particularly when certain people say, if it's not in the Bible, you can't call it revelatory. And I say, wait a minute now. Here is the quintessential Orthodox Catholic of the 12th century saying experience is a way in which we encounter word in our lives. So I'm going to tell you three quick stories that have been important to me and will have something to do with what I then want to uh, reflect more fully upon. The first comes from uh, an experience I had when I was Bishop of Chicago. One of my closest friends was a rabbi. Uh, he was uh, much older, probably the age I am now, uh, and he was German, and he told me at one of our lunches about uh, 
riding in a train from Berlin to a suburb filled with uh, Nazi soldiers who were singing anti-Jewish songs and looked at him and someone said, well, why aren't you singing with us? And out of terror, he joined in singing the song and he said he knew then that he had to leave. So he found his way to the United States and ultimately to Chicago and was one of the uh, senior, in quotation marks, religious leaders of the city and uh, very much my Abba. We used to have lunch, I would pat him on the hand and I'd say, Herman, you are my Abba. And this wonderful sort of rich German voice would say, oh, no, 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 you know, anyhow. Well, he told me I was going to the land of the Holy One and he said, please go to Hebron and pray for me at the tomb of Abraham. Well, I said yes, and only when I got there did I discover how complicated it was to do. Uh, but I did manage to get there, and the tomb is in a Herodian structure. And indeed, there is a cenotaph and a sign saying, you know, tomb of Abraham. Whether he's really there or not, I don't know. But in any event, I was standing in front of it, praying for Herman, and to my left, a group of uh, men were engaged in uh, the Koran study, study the Koran. And to my right, in a vestibule that, that was a synagogue, a group of Jewish women were praying. And I stood there and I thought, we are the three children of Abraham. Why are there three of us? And what does God make of this? And what I decided was, God was saying, I have three children, and I have many more as well, but let's just focus on the Abrahamic three, uh, as, as a way of showing that no one has an absolute corner on me, that my truth is larger than any one tradition. So that was a helpful, uh, practical experience born out of simply showing up and being present. The second one had to do with September 14, after September 11, which was the first day that I, as presiding bishop, could make my way down to uh, uh, what was then becoming ground zero. And en route, I was asked to stop at an Episcopal uh, uh, agency nearby called uh, Siemens Church Institute, uh, which serves uh, those who uh, are uh, in ships that come into the into the harbors. In any event, um, it was filled with, at that point we were calling them uh, rescue workers, of course, there was no one to rescue, but that was the term that was being used at that point. And so there was a respite center for them, and they were eating and sleeping and doing various things, and I was asked if I'd celebrate the Eucharist. And the woman who was in charge of the sacristy came to me with some anxiety and said, well, what propers are you going to use? And I said, well, it's Holy Cross Day, and so we'll use the propers for Holy Cross Day. And the gospel uh, was Jesus saying, and I, when I am lifted up, will draw, the translation in the Bible we use is all people, but panta in Greek means everything, all things to myself. And so I celebrated the Eucharist and then uh, went off to... Uh, where the World Trade Center had been with, with the sandwiches and various things for the workers who were there. And I was in the back of a pickup truck and then coming back, the truck went past St. Paul's Chapel, which is very close to Ground Zero. There's a, a graveyard, the chapel, and then, then uh, the World Trade Center. In any event, the gate was open, so I tapped on the cab and said to the driver, please stop. So he did and I went in uh, the church was unlocked, there was a fine gray dust all, all over the place, but not a window had been broken, very strangely, not a pane of glass had broken in this colonial church. And I found the sacristy door open, and I found a piece of paper and a pencil, I wrote, uh, praying for you, uh, love, Frank Griswold, presiding bishop. And as I left, the priest in charge of the chapel came toward me from the front of the church, the sacristy being in the back, and fell into my arms. And I looked over his shoulder at the altar, 
And over the altar was a small Renaissance crucifix with its arms stretched out like this toward everything that had happened beyond the chapel. All the anger, the rage, the sadness, the loss, the destruction, everything. And I thought to myself, what does the presiding bishop say at a moment like this? And I looked at this little figure with these little arms, and I thought, he can, he can grab it all. Uh, those arms lifted up can draw all things to himself. And I thought, it's not a question of what I can do. It's my trusting in what he can do and being available to the one whose, whose cosmic embrace embraces everyone and everything. So the kind of universal notion of uh, Christ's reach uh, was overwhelmingly brought home to me at that point. And the third, the third story, uh, I was teaching in South Korea at an Anglican uh, seminary, living with a community of Anglican nuns. And one of the nuns, Sister Catherine, uh, who had been professor of English at the Anglican University, uh, had assembled some years ago a gathering of Christian and Buddhist nuns, Roman Catholic, Anglican, and Buddhist nuns. And they, every week, would come together and they would sit for half an hour in silence. And then they would talk, share things. And they had gone to Rome, they'd gone to Canterbury, I'm sure they went somewhere uh, in the Buddhist world as well, as a group, to sort of bear witness to uh, a, a deep unity that could be discovered uh, when one is silent and prayerful. And in any event, they, they said, oh, you must give a talk on uh, Thomas Merton. So uh, I obliged, and we sat for half an hour. And then at the end, a Buddhist nun came to me, a very stalwart Buddhist nun. Many nuns are very stalwart. I appreciate that. <laughs> They're fearless. I've, I've said to my Roman Catholic nun friends, I think it's just as well you're not ordained because you're not part of the hierarchical structure. You have a freedom uh, that those within it don't have. And furthermore, you own hospitals and colleges. So you're women of power and possession. So bishops have to take you seriously. But in any event, uh, this is that kind of a, that kind of a nun. So she, she came at me and she said, do you feel it is your obligation to try to convert me to Christianity? And I said, no. I said, my Christianity makes me eager to know what the divine or the ultimate, however you would describe it, is up to in your tradition and what your symbol systems and scriptures may reveal to me that would enrich my own experience of the divine as I have known it uh, through the Christian tradition. So um, uh, those three experiences uh, uh, have been sort of foundational in a way to my sense of uh, the world as word in a very large way. And uh, I point out here too that the word word, which in Hebrew, davar, uh, means speech, also means event and circumstance. So words can happen as well as being spoken, uh, which is very important, I think. I mean, God spoke, and it came to be, and it was good. And then for the Christians, the word was made flesh uh, and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. So uh, uh, God addresses us through things that happen, as well as through scripture or uh, spoken words. Um, and I think here, too, of uh, uh, Moses saying in the book of Deuteronomy to the children of Israel, the word is not in heaven, neither is it beyond the sea, nor it's very, it is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart ready to be kept. There's a sense in which we're indwelt by virtue of our creation, uh, by uh, the, the word of God, which I will get to uh, more fully uh, when we move along. So uh, word. Word 
uh, in the early church had a richness of meaning. It was inherited first from the Jewish tradition, but it also drew from Hellenic uh, philosophy, where word, the word logos was the rational principle of the universe, and in time it became associated with the second person of the Trinity, and uh, we can speak then of the incarnate word uh, Jesus as the word embodied. So let me move on then. This world is word, expression, news of God. Its work is to name and praise God. Uh, and I love the idea that, that, that the, the fundamental um, job of the created world is to name and praise and reveal God. Uh, yes, name and praise and reveal God and also sustain life, obviously. I mean, it's not just sort of abstract, you know, the trees are off praising God. No, the trees are part of what we need. Uh, the whole system uh, of uh, uh, the universe is part of what sustains and uh, gives us life. And I think it's so important for us to see ourselves as part of creation and not over against creation or creation is it and in some way we're excluded from that. So I think uh, the, the, the world is sacramental. It's revelatory. It's, it, it reveals more than simply what we see on the outside. And I'm thinking here of, uh, you know, what happens when we're standing on a lake uh, side watching a sunset? I mean, what is it that moves within us? It's not rational. We suddenly feel what? That we're part of something larger? or we feel rooted and grounded in some way, or we feel peaceful. Uh, I know sometimes when I'm overwrought, cloud formations can be very consoling. I think, you know what? I'm frantic about this particular thing. You know what? There's a larger world out there. I mean, it isn't all my, my preoccupation of the moment. Uh, and, uh, you know, suddenly the ocean rolling, 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 a kind of vastness that, that speaks and, and places us uh, in, in, in a way that uh, uh, our own thinking couldn't possibly do it. So there are ways in which the world endlessly is speaking to us, uh, though we may not name it that way. We may just say, oh, I saw a wonderful sunrise today. It just it was such a good way to begin the day. Well, it was more than that. It was an encounter, an encounter with the divine revealed in that particular form. And it's interesting how the Psalms sort of pick this up. I was looking at Psalm 147, in which uh, uh, the, 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 the world is addressed. Praise God, sun, moon, all you shining stars, and you highest heavens. Praise God from the earth, sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, praise God, snow and frost, mountains and all hills, animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, praise God, kings of the earth and all people, old and young together. So uh, the, the, whole, the whole creation is invited to praise, praise. And I think it's our, our task to give voice to creation as it praises, give voice through honor and respect, uh, give voice by recognizing where creation is suffering and being misused, uh, and look at our own uh, relation to, to the natural world. Uh, Phoebe and I, my wife, have a house in New Hampshire which has a large field below it, and in typical kind of suburban order, uh, for many years, we had the field mowed regularly, so it almost looked like a lawn, but not quite. And then I read about monarch butterflies that simply disappeared. There had been monarch butterflies, and we didn't see any for a long time. And I read that they needed milkweed. And I thought, oh, my Lord, I mean, I've cut down so much milkweed for years. What happens if we let the field just grow? So I think I was more willing to do this than Phoebe. She hadn't read the article. And she said, the field looks awful. I said, no, no, we leave. We leave all the milkweed. We leave all the milkweed. And this year, we had a number of monarch butterflies flying around. And I would go down to the milkweed several times a day and check on the little caterpillars as they were <laughs> munching. And I get upset when 
I'd count six, and then the next day there'd be four, and then there'd be eight, and I thought, where are they? I'd look under the leaves. I thought I had to shepherd them in some way. <laughs> and I thought, well, this tiny example uh, could be writ large. It has to do with how does one live in balance with uh, the needs of the natural world, and where is our sort of superimposing of our sense of order, or I'd like a nice, tidy field, uh, really working against something. Where is what, what we might perceive as chaos actually uh, the way in which uh, the divine is trying to bring about whatever uh, is going on in that particular manifestation of creaturely uh, reality. Um, and then again, uh, I was thinking of a, of a canticle we have in the prayer book, the Song of the Three Men, which is rather similar, all you works of the Lord, glorify the Lord. Sun and moon, winter and summer, chill and cold, nights and days, glorify the Lord. Light and darkness, earth, all that grows on the earth, birds, flocks, men, women, everywhere, glorify the Lord. And I love, I don't know if you're familiar with the book of Jonah, but there's this wonderful, you know, Jonah's told to go preach to Nineveh to repent. And Jonah says, God, if I do that, they will repent. And, and of course, God says, nonetheless, you have to go and do it. So he goes and he, you know, fire and brimstone, all the rest of it. And uh, they repent. And he's, of course, furious and sits under a bush. And the bush dies and he's upset. And God says, you're more upset over the bush that died than over all the people in Nineveh. What's wrong with you? In any event, part of what happens in Nineveh, which I think is so wonderful, they're all called to repent in sackcloth, including the animals, including the animals. The animals are in sackcloth, and the animals, along with the, the humans, are told to taste no food and eat, uh, drink no drink, and to cry mightily to the Lord. And I thought, I could just hear it. Humans going, oh, oh, oh cows, wah, wah, you know, this whole. And I thought, clearly, the animals are part of the community. They're not sort of useful to the community, they're integral to the community. Uh, and I thought that was such an interesting, an interesting uh, inclusion. And I was thinking, the New York Times had an article on dogs not too long ago about uh, dogs having affection. And I thought, I thought, I read it and I thought of, uh, you know, uh, you, you think of your own situation. We hadn't had dogs, Phoebe and I, uh, but we inherited her mother's dog when her mother died, and she came home with Fiona, and she said, we now have Fiona, and I said, what, we're having Fiona? And the first night, Fiona jumped on the bed, and I looked at Phoebe, and I said, this will not do. <laughs> of course, within three days, I was a wreck if Fiona wasn't on the bed, but anyhow, uh, and then uh, Fiona used to come into my study and lie in a chair as I uh, did things on the laptop, but then something would go wrong, and I would get furious, like, God damn it, blah, blah, blah. and Fiona would be right over, and her paws would be on my knee, and she'd look up very concerned, and I had to pull myself together and pretend that I was calm, and it didn't make any difference for the sake of the dog. Uh, but I just, I just say that because, uh, and there are other pets you could name, but I think there is really something very real about the relationship between us and animals. I remember taking Fiona once to a senior citizen's place to the, uh, the medical unit uh, to see someone, and uh, all these people were sitting watching television and looked half dead to me. But the moment Fiona appeared, people woke up, and could we pat her? And, th and there was energy, and Fiona then became uh, you know, a, a central focus in their experience. So, you, uh, you know, the, the word coming at us through creation, the word comes in so many ways as events disguised in things that are completely ordinary that we would never, never notice uh, in other circumstances. And then just to go back to creation praising, I was thinking then of Francis Canticle. Uh, uh, his Canticle of the Creatures, which was composed as he was dying. 
I think that's very important. It wasn't that he was sort of having a nice day looking at sunrises. He was dying uh, with a terrible eye disease that was very painful. And he had a dream in which he saw the cosmos transfigured, uh, water shining and stones that were golden. And he woke up and he said, I wish to compose a new song of praise. And so, laudate si mi signore, laudate si being the incipit or the beginning of, of papal encyclical on the environment, uh, was what came into being. And uh, what's so interesting about his prayer, and it's in a hymn, hymn version or a hymnal, praise be my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother's son, who is the day and through whom you give us light, through Sister Moon and the stars, Brother Wind, Sister Fire, Brother Sister Earth, Mother, uh, who produces uh, various fruits with colored flowers and herbs. Notice this is now brother and sister. The creation is now uh, part of part of this uh, deep sense of uh, relationship. Uh, Francis was sort of transfigured by uh, a, a deep sense of love for everything. And so brother this and brother that and sister this and sister that, the whole creation became uh, embraced in a kind of fraternal way. And though this may seem extreme to some of us uh, in terms of our own relationship, I do think there are times when even you're, you're tending some plant and it begins to look sickly and you actually feel sorry for it and you try to put the right whatever it is to make it come back to life again and there's a sadness if it dies and you know it's not like a friend or something but nonetheless there's sort of a sense of a relationship and I think this sort of uh, intimacy uh, between uh, the things of the world and uh, our own selves was something that is captured uh, very much by, by Francis. Um, and so he's much more than bird baths and bunnies. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, this, whole, this whole vision of the wholeness of creation and our intimate relationship with it as brother and sister uh, was born out of intense suffering. Uh, often suffering purifies us and allows us to see more clearly than we could see when everything is in order. Anyhow, I want to um, spend a little time with, yes, the creation is word, but the word of the heart of the word is the person of Christ. And uh, in scripture, Christ is the agent of creation. I think this is very, very important. When in the Nicene Creed we say, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things were made, it is Jesus Christ we're referring to. So he is the agent of creation. And of course, in the Gospel of John, the, the preamble, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, nothing came into being, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So uh, we meet Christ in creation. We meet Christ in ourselves. We meet Christ in one another because we're indwelt by Christ by virtue of simply being human. And so, it, you know, this sort of cosmic embrace that I was talking about at the beginning, uh, it's because everyone who exists in some way exists because Christ is the agent of creation. Now I realize that can sound very, what would I say, possessive to people who don't have a sense that Christ is integral to their, their life or reality. And so I would say then maybe the logos, the logos or the divine principle that we know and name as Jesus Christ is in fact in all of us. And so one of the one of the endless uh, explorations we make in our lives is uh, recognizing Christ in one another. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to do, I will admit. Uh, and I think here are some wonderful words of Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, the cosmos is fundamentally and primarily living. Christ, through his incarnation, is interior to the world, rooted in the world, 
in its tiniest atom. And so that changes, quite frankly, my view of creation. It changes my view of even difficult people. I think, who, 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 who are you disguised as in this particular person, O oh, risen and living one, that I find it so hard to recognize? <laughs> And I will say, I had a wonderful, when I was rector of a church in Philadelphia, I had a, you know, I, I, I taught liturgy. I was planned all the liturgies for the bishop and things like that. Uh, I was Mr. Liturgy. Uh, and uh, I managed to uh, win over most of the parish. But there was one man who, at the exchange of the peace, would kneel down and open a hymnal over his head <laughs> to protect himself from any human contact. And it used to drive me crazy uh, until I realized one day that he was actually for my salvation. Lest I feel that I was indeed the absolute final word on things liturgical, there needed to be someone who, who wasn't beguiled by Frank Griswold and his, <laughs> his clever ways. And so, Sometimes that difficult person is exactly who we need. That critic is exactly who we need to liberate us from a sense of our own rightness or our own rectitude. So uh, uh, I think then of uh, the whole mystery of, of our lives and, and, and the creation that surrounds us. And I also think how important human agency is. I was looking at uh, uh, some of the incidents in Scripture. I was thinking, first of all, of Moses standing on uh, the shores of the Red Sea with the, the Egyptians in hot pursuit. And uh, according to a, a midrash uh, uh, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, uh, Moses was there saying, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And they said, God, do something. And God says, for heaven's sake, raise your staff. And so it's when Moses raises his staff, the waters part. So, you know, I mean, God could have done it on God's own, but no, no. Uh, the, the staff needed to be raised. And I was thinking, too, of uh, uh, Mary's Annunciation. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, I have news. And she says, I'm sure, I mean, it says she was deeply troubled as well she might be. And she says, uh, finally, be it unto me according to your word. But the angel also says something else. It's a kind of throwaway line. Oh, by the way, your kinswoman Elizabeth is in her sixth month. Hint, hint, hint. So Mary is described as rushing, hurrying off to be with Elizabeth. And when she gets to Elizabeth, Elizabeth says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? and I think hugs her. And it's at that point and not before that Mary sings, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has done great things for me. Her Magnificat is the result of a second annunciation from a very human voice. And I think sometimes uh, we'll have a sort of intuition or a, there's sort of a should I, shouldn't I, I think I should maybe, and then someone comes along who suddenly says something that confirms it. And we think, wow. And they didn't even know what we were thinking about or how we were feeling. Uh, uh, it's amazing how, how we are used again and again. Uh, we are used for the sake of others, and others are used uh, on our behalf. And the wonderful thing is most of the time we don't know when it happens. I mean, we might know when someone speaks a word to us that is actually the risen Christ addressing us through them, but seldom do we know when uh, we have been a similar minister to other people, fortunately, or we would think we were God's gift, you know. I mean, I have to say, I've had years of, you know, pastoral ineptitude, uh, but uh, I'm so aware of moments when I thought I was a complete fool. How could I have been so stupid? Why did I say that? Or you know, why did I hug them? They hate to be hugged or something or other. And then later on, people say, you don't know how much it meant when you said this or did that. And I'm sure you've 
all had people say that to you. Well, you're seeing me, you, the risen Christ is acting through you. That's what's, that's what's happening. And I think, too, I think, too, the, uh, 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 the enlargement of our own consciousness that, that the risen Christ uh, affects in us through the agency of the Holy Spirit uh, is so, so very uh, important for us to attend to. And our spiritual disciplines, and I'll talk more about those tomorrow, really, uh, really are ways to attune us to the spirit who is working within us, the spirit of the risen Christ, who is always uh, addressing us. Uh, Clement of Alexandria in the, th in the third century talked about uh, the word of God tuning the universe so that it can sing and the cos tuning the cosmos so that it can sing, and then tuning that small cosmos, the human person, so that person can sing in concert with the larger song of the universe. And I love, it's a lovely image of uh, being caught up, drawn beyond ourselves into uh, the force field of God's own imagination, which is so much larger than anything we could ask or imagine. My ways are not your ways, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord in Isaiah. And the older I get, the more I realize uh, I have no corner on uh, the wackiness of the spirit or what's going to happen next. And I just hope I can show up and be obedient to whatever it's about and let it happen through me, even though I may never understand it and may even resent having been caught up into whatever it was. Uh, so those are some thoughts. Uh, it's about quarter to eight. I was told about 40 minutes uh, and not more, lest you uh, begin rumbling around. And at this point, maybe, uh, I mean, I can go on forever. That's the part of being a bishop. You can talk forever. <laughs> but uh, maybe there's some, you know, <laughs> comments, reactions, rebuttals, amplifications. Uh, so we've got a two-fisted operation here. Um, Evan will be here, and we'll, we'll get the microphone. Do you rem do remember that because we live stream this to people who are not here, that please do wait till the microphone gets to you and talk into the microphone. Don't talk at the microphone down here. Uh, that you have no vocal in your legs there. Uh, but go ahead and just talk right into the microphone. So questions, comments, we'd be glad to field them. but not everyone at once, please. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, my question for you is, I, I'm very fairly new to the church, um, but I read in the pamphlet and before that you've done a lot of ecumenical work. Done a lot of what? Ecumenical yes, work. Yes, right. Uh -huh. And I'm just curious why. Uh, I've encountered people, um, which I have always kind of scratched my head at, that sometimes are like, they don't get that, uh, you know, if that makes sense. I don't know if you've encountered why, those people. Why, why be ecumenical? Yeah. Okay, That's a fairly good question. First of all, I think we're all prone to various kinds of idolatry. And one of the idolatries we can fall into is the idolatry of our own particular religious tradition with all its curiosities that are very consoling and very familiar and very grounding and all that sort of positive stuff, but they can also be very limiting. And just as I think I can benefit from Buddhism and Judaism and Islam, at least in theory, uh, I can certainly benefit from an evangelical experience, a charismatic experience, and so uh, what, I, what interests me about ecumenism is we all, have our, we all have our vocabularies. And so how can I speak uh, a multilingual uh, Christian language, a multidimensional Christian language that can hear, you know, the charismatic experience of being slain in the spirit and not go, oh my God, that never could happen in my church. I hope it doesn't. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be so embarrassed, you know, that kind of thing. But, but here it, okay, here it is something, you know, the spirit can do all kinds of wild things. And is it my parochialism uh, that is keeping me from being able to appreciate this sort of larger reality? 
So I think it's very important. I mean, it's, there's, only one, there's only one Jesus. Uh, and fortunately, he's rather generous in showing up in a lot of uh, ways and uh, uh, not rebelling against various interpretations. But nonetheless, I think uh, ecumenism is a way of saying, I can be enlarged by your experience of the gospel, though it may be different from mine. So that's why I think it's important. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, I keep uh, running into these wonderful articles that your daughter Eliza writes. Oh, yes. And I'm wondering if you'd be comfortable saying a little bit about what she's doing these days. Yes, my Pulitzer Prize winning daughter Eliza Griswold. I may have been the presiding bishop, but now I am the father of Eliza Griswold. <laughs> I mean, she trades off me too, I will tell you. But anyhow. Um, well, actually, I do know what she's doing because she called me the other day and, and for 45 minutes read me the prospectus of a new book she's planning to write, which is, I mean, one of her virtues, and she has many, one of them is she sees things in shades of gray rather than black and white, which I think is a quintessentially Anglican way of seeing things. She could deal with complexity and paradox, as can the spirit. I mean, look at... I mean, look at the incarnation. Is anything more ambiguous than the way in which Jesus came into the world? If I were going to stage it, there'd be angels singing and this golden figure would drop down into the, fully grown into the middle of something. I'd say, wow. But, you know, a poor couple from the countryside, you know, Nazareth, who's ever heard of Nazareth? And they couldn't even afford the expensive uh, sacrifice. Anyhow, uh, that's a digression. Uh, ambiguity is, she's, she's good at this sort of stuff. So uh, she's writing a book on, on evangelicals, but she's writing on, what would I say, manifestations of evangelism that were surprising and contradict the usual uh, take that is given. So, it's more complex, and she's weaving into it, which is going to be very interesting to me, her own, her own what would I say, uh, uh, journey as a child of a cleric uh, through her own having to sort of discover who she is apart from, uh, you know, the sort of dominant family tradition and all that. Uh, to where she is now. So it's, it's, it, she said, I'm going to have to be part of this in a direct way. She said, this is going to be different for me. It's not simply reporting. So that's what she's working on. I don't think it's inappropriate to say that that's what she's hoping to write. Yeah. yeah. No, your um, optimism and uh, acceptance comes through very loud and clear. My question would be is, though, where do you draw the line? Where, where do you decide that something is beyond what you ex experience is acceptable? Well, I think... When, if when does gray become black, I guess? Well, I think if, you're, if it's going to harm someone, uh, that's an obvious, that's an obvious uh, point to sort of wonder what this is about. Uh, it's very hard to deal with that question hypothetically. I think... I think uh, one has to plot this very carefully. Obviously, there are, there are all sorts of behaviors or reactions to people around you that are uh, uh, diminishing or denying uh, of their own dignity. Uh, so I think one has to be very careful in how one plots. I mean, I, I would say the question is, what is the, what is the, what is the good in this? in this possible decision, or what is, the, what, is, what is the downside of it? Discernment of spirits is always something one has to engage in. Pamela? My ears perked up when you mentioned T.R. de Chardin, and I wondered if, because I just discovered him in a church group reading last year, mm -hmm. and then bought other books and got in, you know, completely involved in way, of course, over my head. But um, I wondered if you have personally learned something from Teilhard 
de Chardin? Well, I, I do think, I do think the whole notion of the cosmic Christ is very much at the center of his uh, reflections. He's a mystic, really. Uh, and so I found that, that very broadening. I mean, I don't simply think of Jesus in the Gospels or, you know, Christ in the life of the church. I think of Christ more broadly uh, shimmering in hidden ways in the universe and in human life and uh, uh, how Christian disciplines are there to help us uh, recognize uh, and respond to these hints and guesses, to borrow from T.S. Eliot, that accost us day by day, moment by moment. And I think there's so much, there's so much revelation that we miss altogether sometimes because of the limitation of our own views of Christianity or the church. Uh, and I think people like Teilhard de Chardin sort of break us open to a larger, a larger view. Of course, it's fascinating. He's now very much in vogue now. You know, for, he went out of vogue for a while, and now he's back. He's, he's a big item, so you're right, you're right with the times. <laughs> Keep reading. <laughs> but I don't understand it all either. Just see it, just see it as, as, it's, as mystical. Uh, he's trying to, in many instances, put into words what is ineffable, that really can't be expressed except through metaphor, and he uses a, a lot of language, obviously, from the world of paleontology, because that was his discipline. Okay. Could you speak a little about your work on the Anglo, uh, Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, for a number of years I was a member and then the co-chair, the Anglican co-chair of the International Anglican Roman Catholic Theological uh, Consultation. And uh, over the years we produced agreed statements on various things like the Eucharist, the ministry, and uh, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, for example. Uh, so supposedly uh, dealing with uh, uh, church dividing issues and looking for a common mind. And the fascinating thing is the, the group has been made up of equal numbers of Anglicans and Roman Catholics, always some bishops, some theologians, uh, male and female, uh, and some uh, clergy. And the curious thing is um, when you put this group together and they meet regularly in different places, I mean, the uh, Palazzola outside of Rome is where I'd want to meet all the time. It's a, a, a wonderful country villa uh, with uh, orchards and, and vines and fabulous food, or Montmartre where the nuns serve great wines with uh, beef en croute and whatnot. But then you go to the Church of Ireland uh, 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 Educational College and it's, it's beans and par pork pie and it's a whole other story. But the, po the point is that um, as, we get, as we got to know one another, and, I, and this is always the case, I mean, at first there's sort of, you know, uh, jockeying and caution, but as you get to know one another and as you give people, you know, something for their indigestion in the middle of the night, you give a, a wafer that could be a communion wafer size uh, digestive tablet to a Roman Catholic cardinal, I sort of think, well, this is a form of communion. I mean, God is sort of watching this whole. Again, this is sort of the, 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 uh, the humor, the humor in grace as it overtakes us. Uh, they grow, we grow closer and closer together, and, and there's a genuine desire to find a common mind, which we always manage to do. The problem then is that this formal report is promulgated and sent out, and none of the human investment uh, and the mutual discovery that led to the report is translated through the text. And so Roman Catholics or Anglicans read this thing and they say, well, this isn't the way we've ever talked about this. What is this? I don't recognize my tradition in this because uh, in order to find this common mind, uh, a whole new vocabulary in many cases that transcends both the sort of uh, language of Trent or the language of the Reformation has to be found. So the real problem, as I see it, is um, 
how do you translate what's an intensely human experience uh, into something that people can uh, assimilate beyond the group that produces you know, the formal report. And that, that is, that's been my concern all, of, all along. Uh, but I must say, I mean, the Vatican, I'll, I'll tell you this, the Vatican is far from a monochromatic. I mean, there are people in the dicasteries that have always the Vatican are all in favor of the ordination of women, uh, have very generous views toward human sexuality. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, the, the magisterium gives the appearance or it used to. I mean, with Francis, there's so much dissent that uh, you can't say the magisterium is uh, pristine in view as it was before. Uh, but uh, uh, the magisterium gives the appearance. It's sort of the bottom. I asked the Jesuit, what's the magisterium for you, the sort of formal position of the church? He said, it's sort of the baseline, and you go from there. I thought, well, now that's an interesting point of view, uh, very Jesuitical. Uh, so there is sort of a sense of, under the, under the umbrella of this is the, this is the absolute truth or whatever, there are all sorts of things that go on, modifications. Uh, uh, I mean, it's such a vast community that uh, uh, things that would show up immediately in an Episcopal environment don't show up as easily necessarily in a Roman Catholic one. So you know, nuns are saying mass and doing all kinds of things. Uh, you know, quietly. I don't mean the entire church is behaving that way, but a lot's going on. Uh, there's a lot of ferment and a lot of uh, uh, eagerness to uh, uh, move, I think, in a more progressive way, formally, as, as Francis is trying to do. I have a Jesuit friend who wrote me when I became the presiding bishop. He said, I'm a Jesuit with an Anglican soul. And I wrote back and said, I'm an Anglican with a Jesuit soul. So. <laughs> We, we finally met at St. Peter's about a year ago. <laughs> Questions or comments? Frank, in your book, I like the way you refer to yourself not as retired, but as pensioned. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing? And do you have another book in the works? And could you talk about your book, Praying Our Days? Oh, OK. All right. Um, well, I do more than I should, I think, according to Phoebe. She said, she said I thought you were retired. But uh, then she said, no, you need to do these things. So she's very generous in uh, allowing me to be out and about. And her focus right now is grandchildren. She said, that's my role. I don't have to decorate things you do anymore. I mean, not that, she, not that she ever disliked that, but there was sort of a formal role she played when I was the presiding bishop, and now she's grandma, which she likes. But I do a fair amount of uh, teaching and re retreat things. I'm very glad that I, I'm not politically significant. You know, I don't have, I'm, I'm not responsible for something that is upsetting people. I can say, oh, I'm so sorry you're upset. Or I can try to interpret it in a way that makes them less so, but I don't have to bear the, the burden of responsibility. Uh, Praying Our Days was a little prayer book I put together because I felt that uh, though we revised the prayer book, the spirituality of the prayer book, or how people might use the prayer book more intimately in their own uh, uh, spiritual life, uh, needed some help. So I wrote a little book that fits into a you know, pocket or a pocket book. Uh, with things on prayer and examples and the Eucharist and examples and uh, ways in which the whole tradition of the prayer book could become uh, richer and deeper. That's sort of part of what I'm up to. I, th I think that's about what you asked, isn't it? Okay. okay. Bishop, if I may ask, I, I appreciated what you said earlier in your remarks about uh, creation as community. And I, I wonder ways in which that's in tension with language that I hear often about stewardship of creation, the extent to which sort of creation becomes sort of instrumental to us instead yeah. of partners. Do, do you, are there theologians or voices in the church or, or in the shared conversation between church and, and others who speak about caring for creation as community rather than sort of that dominant yeah, uh, yeah. figure? 
I'm not really aware of that, and I think it has, that's why I want to stress the presence of Christ in creation and in us, and so it's all, we're all bound together in an intimate way. And I was thinking the other day, I turned on a faucet, and I thought, I'm letting the water run while I open the shaving cream. I thought, no, no, I'm wasting the water. And then I thought, now water, actually, I'm, a lot of me is water. You know, we're water. So it's not that over there, and now I now control it by turning it on and off. I need it. I live in an intimate relationship with water. And I sort of thought, this is true of so many things with, uh, with creation. We live in an intimate relationship, and I think, you know, the whole business of the ozone layer. I mean, as a child, the sun was a wonderful positive image. The sun of righteousness rising, you know, Christ. I mean, uh, 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 Clement of Alexandria uses the sun. Francis of Assisi calls the sun brother. And I thought, now, I look at my, my uh, six-year-old grandson. I mean, he, he's fully shrouded when he goes swimming in a lake. And God knows how many unguents have to be put on him and hats. And I thought, okay, now the sun has become an enemy, a threat, and it's our fault. We've lost our proper relation to the sun. And I look at all the idiocy that's going on in Washington, and uh, I just can't believe. I can't believe people could be so stupid uh, as to <laughs> call back, you know, call back these. That's in tomorrow's scripture. <laughs> but let me, if we're, end, if we're ending. One more question. Okay, sure, okay, because I have a final word to say, okay. One more question, Carson. Hi, Reverend, uh, Carson, thanks for speaking. Enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, my question is, my mom told me that um, we're created in God's image, not in the way that we have uh, two arms and two legs and a head, um, but in the way that we can love. So my question to you is, do you think loving is instinctual or is it learned? Thank you. That is perfect. Um, that is a wonderful question because God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. In other words... I think being created in God's image is the capacity to love. Uh, and we simply accept it as part of being human. And yet it is our participation in the divine nature to borrow from 2 Peter. And the, the Eastern tradition, many people in the Eastern tradition make a, con a contrast between image and likeness. Image is what we're given the capacity to love. It, of course, can be misused and misdirected, but nonetheless, there it is, uh, our participation in God's own reality. And I think we, I mean, to say God is love is inadequate. Our, let's put it this way. God is total beyond any comprehension. But for our sake, we can say God is love. That's true, but it's not everything about God's nature. Uh, God's nature in us, we know as love. Uh, however, uh, image likeness is something we're growing toward. Uh, likeness is our unfolding and our growing up in all ways into Christ, to borrow words from St. Paul, our being conformed to the image of Christ, our saying yes to the Christ within us and living in communion with that reality and then allowing it to express itself in our lives. So image and likeness, it's a journey. And it's a journey that takes us through life, into death, and into this wonderful thing in the Revelation of John, which is incomprehensible, but nonetheless quite wonderful in points. There's a white stone with a new name that will be given to those who are faithful on the other side of death. And so I know there is a Frank that I know nothing about, but God in God's imagination has this full sense of who I am. And one day... On the other side of death, I may know who I am. But right now, as St. Augustine said, we are a mystery even to our own selves. So the, the journey in fidelity to image, in other words, uh, living out of love, uh, produces a maturity uh, that then allows me to become who in grace and truth I'm called to be. What we shall be is yet to be revealed, uh, says 
1 John. So I don't know. I'm on the way. We all are. Let's hope we're faithful and we get to what God has in mind for us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. Okay. Okay, here are three more things. They're not by me. One is by Shao Pegi. It's about grace. We're going to hear a lot about God's grace. Grace is insidious. When it doesn't come straight, it comes crooked. When it doesn't come bent, it comes broken. When it doesn't come from above, it comes from below. I think we sometimes have very tidy notions of how God works. Forget it. God is very untidy and very surprising, and uh, often things that seem completely inappropriate to us are exactly how God and God's grace is getting at us. Uh, the other two other things, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, for Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. So, Christ is playing through you and to you through the faces of those around you who bear the image of Christ. And the last thing, as part of this journey from um, image to likeness, uh, let an Easter in us be a day spring to the dimness of us, be a crimson crested East. Again, Gerard Manley Hopkins, uh, The Wreck of the Deutschland. But I love it. Easter is a verb. The Easter in Christ. How is Christ Eastering in you through the power of love? It's, I think, a good question to ask yourselves as you go off into the night and prepare for uh, Sunday morning. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Griswold. Thank you all. Don't forget that Bishop Griswold will be staying around to sign books. Books are available for purchase. Hope to see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. That was just wonderful. Thank you. Oh, you're very I welcome. Every bit. Thank you so much. May I take your microphone from you? <laughs> you, you before you get in trouble. I, no, I don't, I don't want to go home with it.